Thank you for joining us today. This program is presented by the National Nordic Museum um, in conjunction with a special exhibition, Fischersund Faux Flora, which opened just this last Saturday and will be on view at the museum in Seattle until January 26. It is an exhibition that uh, celebrates the collaboration of an artistic family um, and uh, an art collective and explores um, new uh, new flora for Iceland. And so that was a jumping off point, a source of inspiration for this exhibition related lecture. And I am so happy um, to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Pavel Bosevich, um, who is uh, with the Natural Science Institute of Iceland. And his talk today is called Roots of Change, the History and Impact of Plant Immigration and Human Flora Interactions in Iceland. But first, I'd like to provide you with a bit of background uh, for our special guest speaker. So Dr. Vasevich is a botanist and senior scientist, as I mentioned, at the Natural um, Science Institute of Iceland. And um, he has been working there since 2012. He obtained his PhD in biology and botany from the University of Silesia in 2010. His research career includes authorship of 45 articles in international peer-reviewed journals, with 20 as the first or sole author. His work has appeared in high-impact journals such as Nature Ecology and Evolution, Global Ecology and Conservation, and Botanical Journal of the Linnaean Society. Additionally, he's authored three books and five book chapters. Dr. Vasevich has also supervised masters and PhD students. Um, he's held significant administrative roles, including chair of the group of experts of invasive alien species of the Berne Convention on the conservation of European wildlife and natural habitats since 2014, and as advisor on exotic species to the Icelandic government since 2016. He chairs the expert panel on the Student Innovation Fund at the Icelandic Center for Research. He's recognized for his contributions to botany and ecology, particularly in the study of invasive species and their impacts on natural habitats. Welcome, Dr. Vasevich. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. I'm very happy that um, I got this opportunity to share uh, some information about the Icelandic flora. And um, in today's presentation, I would like to focus on the Icelandic flora and I would like to explore its history and uh, and highlight uh, in my talk, plant species that are introduced to Iceland through human activity. And these species are often referred to as non-native or invasive species. And I think that they, they deserve much more attention and much more consideration than they have received in the past. Uh, please allow me to begin by quoting the fragment from the um, official news that was released uh, uh, not so far ago by the United Nations, introducing the IPBES report on invasive alien species. That's a global report focusing on this problem. And it describes biological invasions as a severe global environmental threat that is underappreciated, underestimated, and often unacknowledged. And regrettably, this assertion holds particularly true, especially in Iceland. And here, because here the issue of invasive alien species and in general, but invasive plant species in particular, has been neglected for far too long. And public awareness of this issue is very low and existing policies fail to provide effective tools to counter this serious threat. Uh, let me also introduce some basic terms. Um, and the first term is the term that, that is biological invasion. What does it mean? Well. It refers to the process in which human activities, whether deliberate or accidental, uh, transport or move a species beyond its natural range. So we can imagine a species that has a natural range somewhere in the western part of the Northern America, and then the species moves for, moved, for example, to Iceland or to Europe or to any other part of the country of, of the world, and then it becomes uh, non-native or uh, um, alien species. Uh, and basically, these, act these human actions are leading to introduction of the new species to the new areas where it can establish themselves. As we can see, we have transport, then there is introduction, then establishment, which means that the species is able to sustain viable population for a longer time. And then it ends with uh, invasion. 
Um, all living species, therefore, can be classified into several categories. And first, uh, 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 they can be classified into native or non-native or alien. And um, well, and non-native species, so the species that, are, that have been introduced by the human actions, can be further divided into those that are established and those that are not. So those, those that can produce viable self-sustaining populations or not. And among the established species, we have the invasive species, which is a particular group. Uh, and, it, and this term applies specifically to those species, whether plants or animals, that can cause harm to the natural environment. And humans are bringing in new species to different parts of the world faster than ever before. And some of these species become invasive. And what does it mean? They mean, as I said, that they cause harm to nature, sometimes in a ways that cannot be fixed. And these, this, this harm includes, for example, changing or damaging unique communities of plants and animals. And this harms the biosphere, which is, of course, crucial for, for our survival, for human life. Uh, please let us consider just one number. Uh, according to the report I was referring at the beginning, the IPBS report, there are 37,000 established alien species that have been introduced by human activities across all regions and all biomes of the Earth. And um, with new species, new alien species being presently introduced at an unprecedented rate of approximately 200 annually in, a, uh, in, a, in, in the whole world. Uh, when we compare the global trends of immigration on native species, uh, which are on this graph here, to the Icelandic uh, numbers, uh, we can see that we can find them to be quite similar. And as we can see from, from this graph here, if left unchecked, the number of al just alien plant species in Iceland is projected to increase by 85% by the end of the, of the 21st century. Invasive alien species have contributed uh, solely or alongside other drivers to 60% 60, 60 of the recorded global extinctions. And they are the only driver in 16% 16, 16 of the documented global animal and plant extinctions. Uh, another problem that invasive species are, change, uh, are causing, invasive alien species um, are causing, is biotic homogenization. I will be talking about this a, a bit later. And this is a process where biological communities around the world become more similar, more homogenized. It's, an, it's a major negative impact of invasive alien species with consequences for the structure and function of the whole ecosystems. Invasive alien plants uh, or invasive alien species can threaten livelihoods, can threaten water and food security. They threaten economies and human health. They can cause disease, allergies, and even physical injuries. And um, the report I'm, I'm referring to now, the, the IPBS report, found that 85% of impacts of non-native or invasive species are negative, with 15, just 15% 15 of impacts being positive. Um, in Iceland, which as we know, it's an isolated island in the Northern Atlantic, with a very, very small population and difficult climatic conditions, the impact of plant invasions has been so far less pronounced, mainly because of the cold climate and the, and the small population. And we didn't have this problem at such a scale, like, like for example, in some more Southern territories like a European continent. Um, the country therefore fits into a global pattern when the percentage of um, imported alien species is much lower in the Northern areas uh, than in the regions that, uh, that are uh, uh, positioned at the lower latitudes. Um, but well, everything is changing and the Icelandic climate is also changing very quickly. As we can see on this, on this graph here, after a warmer period in the middle of, of the 20th century, we had a, a period of cooling uh, that began in 1960s and then the climate remind, remained a bit cooler until the 1980s. And since the 1980s, as we can see, there is a strong uh, um, warming trend with average temperatures rising by 0.47 degrees Celsius per decade. And this rate of warming is about three times higher than the average for, of the global uh, warming. Well, but this is not only the climate that is changing. 
Iceland has experienced a stunning 30% increase in population just since the beginning of the 21st century. On the top of that, Iceland, like many other regions in the Arctic, has become a major touristic attraction. The number of foreign visitors, as we can see here, has increased enormously. It's about, it was like about 20,000 per year in 1995. Uh, in two, 2023, so the last year, it was over 2 million, which is a hundredfold increase just in over two decades. This is a huge change. And these two human related, just these two human related factors, the population and the, uh, and the hundredfold increase in the tourists, uh, in the tourism, uh, are already causing enormous, and I would say indeed unprecedented pressure on the natural environment in Iceland. As shown in this graph, there is a clear and direct correlation between the Iceland's, Iceland total population, which is shown by the gray area, and um, uh, and the number of non-native uh, uh, species, plant species that are present in Iceland. As we can see, when the population started to explode, uh, in the beginning of 20th century, there was also a clear uh, increasing trend in non-native plant species that are represented, as I said, by the red line on this graph. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that global warming, um, that with the global warming, there will be a significant expansion of the ecological niche, so of the areas that are suitable for many, many species in Iceland, and of course, all, all also for uh, invasive alien species. And this map, I will use an example. This map illustrates changes in environmental suitability based on climatic conditions for lupine. Lupine, so Alaska lupine, Lupinus nutcatensis, is one of the major invasive plants in Iceland. As, and as we can see, the baseline, um, uh, like out, uh, the year 2000, as we can see, just a few areas that are that have like a really, really high environmental suitability. And these areas have been already almost completely invaded by the lupine. But then we can see the change, uh, of course, depending on the emission scenario. This is the lower emission scenario. This is the higher emission, CO2 emission scenarios. And as we can see, by, two, by the, almost by the end of the century, by 2080, this area, that it will be suitable for the lupine colonization will really enormously increase. Well, speaking about the lupine, which is a very beautiful plant at the, at the very end, uh, even though in some areas of Iceland, there is a lot of it, and we can see even a whole fields covered by the lupine, uh, we can be quite sure that in fact, we haven't seen the real invasion yet. And this will come, of course, during the next few decades, probably, before the end of this, this century, uh, with the warming that will be opening new areas for colonization. And in order to quantify the spread of the lupine, we can we can make such an experiment, like divide the whole area of Iceland into five, uh, five by five kilometer squares and respect, retrospectively calculate the number of these squares with, with confirmed presence of lupine. And here what it comes from such an experiment, as we can see, this, this is an impressive growth uh, that can reach open even more than 1,000 percent by the um, by the end of the century. The the points here represent observations, as we know, as and and we can see that they follow this exponential model very very closely. So probably this model will be will be quite um, quite accurate. Um, the linear model offers some some relief, but it's still suggesting a, a tremendous growth um, before the end of the century. Um, but there is another major invader, invader in Iceland, and this invade, invader also came from the southern, uh, western part of the North America, it's lodgepole pine. So maybe this species is also, uh, you are familiar with, with this pine tree. Uh, and the species arrived in Iceland um, in 1940s and have been, actively spread and promoted uh, primarily by the for, uh, forestry department. And now it's present almost all across the Icelandic lowlands. And it's colonizing new areas, I would say at the record speed. We will see the example after, after some, after, uh, on the next slide. And um, 
In fact, this is the main tree species that is uh, used in plantations all across the country. And its, in, in its use is officially encouraged and promoted by the state institutions as an easy solution, an easy fix for carbon offsetting. Um, and let us look uh, on, um, on the results of our um, uh, research that were done in 2021. Uh, in um, in a wallet in southwestern Iceland. Um, the colonization here started with the with the green area that was the original plantation. In in the year two thousand and ten, we can see that this area within this blue uh, polygon has been already colonized. But uh, in the year two thousand and twenty one the amount of the area colonized by Lodgeville Pine increased so much. So this is, as we can see, the, um, a clear um, um, exponential uh, increase in the area colonized by the, by the Lodgeville Pine. Very characteristic for an ongoing invasion process. Uh, let's, let's, let us have a look. How does it look like in the field? Well, here in this in, in more in the background, we can see the original lodgepole pine plantation. Then this dense forest here, and partially also here. This is this is the area that was colonized by 2010. But all this new colonization here and here, and also uh, on the back of the photographer, it, this is the area that has, that has been colonized between just in 10 years, between 2021 and uh, between 2010 and 2021. And as we can see, of course, this is this is just a part of it because the area that here, the area is very, very, very vast area that has been colonized by the lodgepole pine. Um, now we are here. This is a this is a river plain um, at the bottom of the of the Steinadal Valley. And what we can see this valley, this this river, river plain, even though there is a lot of water from time to time. And this area has been all, all, almost completely colonized by the lodgepole pine that is present all over the place here. And this just, well, it's just a question of time when the trees will grow really, really, really um, tall in this area. And here we are almost two kilometers or maybe 2.5 kilometers from the original plantation. The original plantation can be seen here in the very, very distance, but still, a new lodgepole pine plant, uh, lodgepole pine plant are are visible. Um, this colonization is not only um, uh, going on on the horizontal uh, um, area, but also up the hills. And as we can see here, 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 all over the place, we can see the small trees um, that have uh, the parent trees in this plantation spreading all across the um, uh, the valley. But well, one can one can ask, uh, what's the problem with with these trees spreading out of the plantation? Well, uh, in Iceland, most our 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 um, um, ecosystems are mostly open ecosystems. So there, there is no uh, such a plant that can compete with the lodgepole pine or outcompete the lodgepole pine. So when the when the lodgepole pine establishes itself in Iceland, then it grows grows very fast. Uh, the canopy cover closes within decades, and after the canopy cover closes, uh, there is just a green desert. So there is just a lot lodgepole pine above, and almost nothing below. Maybe one or two species, uh, native species that are able to survive below the lodgepole pine Iceland. So as we can see, uh, within next several next decades, if this population will be left unchecked, the 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 the, the, the whole area of this of this uh, of this valley will ultimately be converted into a dense lodgepole pine forest, and the biodiversity of this area will drop significantly. Well, but this is not only the problem of extent. This is also a problem of density. How fast the density of lodgepole pine is increasing, we can see on this uh, on this map. 
again, the green area, it's um, uh, this is an um, original plantation. And then we have uh, the, the, these small circles here. They represent the um, plots in which we are checking the density in 2010 and in 2021. Please notice that the maximal the density in 2000 and, uh, 2010, it was 0 0.5 to 0.6 trees per square meter, which is already quite a significant density. But in the year 2021, the maximal density, which we, which we, which we recorded here, was above six trees per square meter. So this is this is well, this is just packed with the lodgepole pine trees. Um, the problem with the with the in the, with the, with the um, non-native uh, trees is much more pronounced than just this single wally in the south western eastern Iceland, because at the moment we have this large scale afforestation projects underway almost across the Iceland, and they are funded both by the state and the private companies. And the shared goal is to establish a tree cover wherever it's possible, and very often or mainly using the non-native species like lodgepole pine, like uh, sitka spruce, uh, at the expense of native tundra vegetation. And here we have uh, an image that illustrates such a project about 100 kilometers from where I am at the moment. I'm in Akureyri in Northern Iceland, but this is, these are the, the, the land close to Husavik um, in Northern Iceland. And um, as we can see here, tens of hectares of native low shrub communities ha were plowed and well destroyed to make way to these invasive trees that will be planted in these areas. It's clear that this approach that create that are, that is creating open wounds in the native vegetation will result first of all in a massive em CO2 emissions from the soil. So it's at the moment it's uh, it's completely counterproductive, and I uh, I would say that 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 the trees that will be planted at the end here are unlikely to to offset the carbon uh, the, the offset uh, the the carbon emissions that are happening now and uh, and will happen from from this landscape uh, but but of course plant invasions are currently affecting nearly all ecosystems in Iceland including coastal ecosystems one example is the coastal invader Senatio pseudarnica, um, known in Icelandic as a stormfuller. And this photograph was taken in Auftanes, uh, very close to the capital city of Iceland, Reykjavik. And this uh, peninsula, Auftanes, is, ho is home to one of the largest populations of, of this species in Iceland, which covers, as, as we can see very densely, approximately five kilometers of the coastline. And again, we can see the same pattern. So there is a species that is tall enough and, and grows dense enough that it blocks the light and eliminates native coastal vegetation or native coastal species in the areas that invades. We can see this on, the, on, this, on this picture here. As we can see, there is virtually nothing left in the areas that has been colonized by the uh, Senecio Pseudonica. Uh, natural distribution of, of the Senecio uh, Pseudarnica or storm in Icelandic covers, as we can see, the, the areas closer to you, so the, the southern coast uh, of the south, uh, uh, west, west, uh, western coast of the of the North America uh, and the Far East. Uh, it grows there in the beach meadows, young, young dunes and lower four dunes, so mainly in the coastal environments. And just exactly as in Iceland, so this is a perfect environmental uh, fit here. I think no one will be surprised to see this graph and um, showing that a vigorous growth in the number of sites occupied by Sanetsu Pseudarnica in Iceland is still ahead of us. So these are the observations again, and we can see that they follow quite nicely the, the exponential curve again. So again, now we have the locality count below 50, by, be by before of the, of the century, we can expect that it will be probably present all across the coastline in Iceland. Uh, 
in every possible or suitable environment. But I have been talking about the um, uh, flowering plants. Um, uh, so the plants that are tall and and um, and they can be easily spotted, but this is not this is not all, of course. And um, I would also like to tell you about uh, about the moss. This moss, uh, Campylopus introflexus in Latin, or in English, star moss, uh, because of this of these uh, of this characteristic. Uh, um, Hairs that are that, that that are on the on the top of the of this moss, in Icelandic hydrobust, um, eh, and this species is considered invasive in, uh, in northern hemisphere, but native to the southern hemisphere. Um, it started to spread very rapidly uh, in the Europe in the 1940s and in the northern America from 1975, and its spread is attributed to its high dispersal capacity, and lo locally it can be dispersed by fragmentation and over longer distances by small, small spores, and it can quickly and effectively uh, establish on many types of sites uh, where the, there is a long competition from other plants, and often it benefits from disturbances, like for example, burning, trampling, digging by animals, wind erosion, and so on. Um, in Iceland, star moss or Campylopus intraflexus is invading only one type of environment. And this is something very characteristic for Iceland. This is geothermal environments. So the area uh, areas where the ground is hot, well, it, it depends on, on the area, but it can be even to 100, 100 degrees uh, Celsius hot. Um, and, and then in these areas, the, um, the Campylopus or the Sarmos is invading. And as you can see on this picture, it's, it's forming a really, really dense, ma uh, uh, dense mats of vegetation or carpets of vegetation. And this picture I took, uh, I think last year in Bjartaflach. This is in the Mivat area, something like 100 kilometers from here. Uh, and it shows the one of the most invaded geothermal areas in Iceland. As we can see, every single spot, almost every single spot on that area, is already covered by the um, by this invasive moss, star moss. But the species is not only present in the northeast, of course. It's also very common in the south, on the Reykjanes Peninsula, where it managed to colonize almost all geothermal areas. And I would like to give you an example of Grænadalur. It's north from Kveragerti, which is a municipality in the southwestern Iceland. And as we can see, the species is present all over the area. So this is this is the this is the this the uh, the wally here, and we have also Reykjadalur. Uh, those of you who visit Iceland maybe have some. Uh, um, well, are familiar with this Reykjadalur because here we have the river in which you can bath because it's a hot river. But well, let's concentrate just on the on the on the Grænadalur area, and then we have like a green and red spots. The green spots, does, these are the spots that have been yet not not yet colonized by the moss, but the red spots, these are the places colonized already by the um, Campylopus tarmos. So as we can see, the species is present all over the area. And these are not small quantities. I will show you how does it look like um, uh, from a closer point of view. Um, here we have uh, like a hot stream flowing from a hot spring down uh, the, uh, to, the, to the river. And what we can see here, this, well, these areas with the low vegetation, these are the hot grounds. So these are the area where the ground is uh, hot, is, is heated by the geothermal energy from the earth. Uh, I think the, the, the temperature of the ground here is about 50, 60 degrees Celsius. And um, we can see clearly two colors, the light green color here and the remains here. This is what is left from the original native 
vegetation. So the original native mosses that have been growing here for a very long time. But the rest, I mean, this, this gray or um, black grayish area, this is all this invasive moss that has already pushed out all the native vegetation and replaced it almost completely forming, as you can see, very dense um, carpets. So that's how it looks like from a, from a, uh, from the from the point of view of the researcher. But uh, the scale of invasion is in Granadalur is so impressive uh, and it's so big that the areas with the dominance of Campylopus interflexus could be even seen on the aerial photographs. So, well, now now we can just to consider the scale. We are now looking at the areas, we will be, I will be showing you the areas colonized by the moss on aerial photographs. Uh, and again, we have, we can see the whole area here. This is, this is area of the hot ground. This is a really, really vast area at the very bottom of the valley. And again, light green areas. These are the areas with the native vegetation. But here, as we can see here, and also here, and here, and here, here the, um, the, the colonization by the star moss already started and it's all going and we can see this clear color difference on the aerial photographs. So we have the native vegetation and the star moss invading here. Um, another example of a geothermal area, it's a kferadalit, um, quite close to Reykjavik. And again, a dense mat covering the hot geothermal soil. This is just high, uh, this is just the, the star moss. There is nothing else here left. Um, <clears throat> and as we can see, the species is extremely hot tolerant. And in, it can grow also in places where native mosses are disappearing due to the heat. Please uh, le let us look at this, at this photograph. We can see the star moss growing on the site where the temperature at the 10 centimeters below the ground is 98.9 degrees Celsius. So this is really a tolerant species. Um, another example of a very nice geothermal area. This is Brennisteinsfjöll on the Reykjanes Peninsula. It's far, quite far from major touristic routes and major touristic attractions. Out of the scope of most of the locals as well. It takes uh, like a one hour or two hours walk to get from the from here to here to, to, to this place from the from the nearest road. And uh, with close as we can see, this is very nice area with with mosses and and low vegetation and the, and the vapors coming from the hot soil. But with the closer inspection, we can see that uh, uh, the the green moss here that we can see all over the place. This is this is already the star moss that is colonizing, and that's how it looks like. Uh, so the area is completely colonized by the star moss. Um, and how did the moss manage to reach such a remote and well, rarely visited location? The answer may lie in its ability to produce spores that are capable, of course, of traveling long distances. And additionally, the, the, the star moss spreads through fragmentation of its dense carpets. And the, the small pieces of these carpets can be transported by the wind uh, or carried to a new area on boots and clothing. And um, I think this is, this, is, uh, this is really worth mentioning that the helicopters may also play a role in Iceland in spreading the, uh, this invasive moss. Uh, during our research last year and this year, uh, we observed the helicopters transporting tourists directly to the uh, geothermal fields on many places on the Reykjanes Peninsula and south southwestern Iceland. And uh, furthermore, we, there is some online evidence as well. I, I found some films uh, showing people coming uh, on um, on helicopters. Uh, and visiting the the remote geothermal areas, so this is happening. And um, if they land in several such a spots, and then they probably are able to spread this this moss even wider. Uh, the number of alien species, as I said, has been steadily increasing for centuries across 
all the regions of the Earth. Uh, with the global economic costs of invasive alien species uh, quadrupling since 1970. 1970. And even without the introduction of a new species, already established alien species can continue to expand the geographic ranges into new countries, new regions, new ecosystems, in new biomes, including even remote areas, as I showed you. And uh, if given the opportunity, of course, and under the business as usual scenario, and that we do 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 not do not nothing about you know the spread of invasive alien species, where the current trends continue to un unchecked, the total number of alien species globally is projected to about one third higher by the just by the 2050 compared to 2005. And of course, this incurs the cost because, um, uh, well, uh, at the very end, people start to realize. That, that that these invasive species have to be has to be have to be removed, and this of course in this is one of the factors that incurs the co the cost. But uh, there are also costs that are associated with the introduction of alien species that many of us fail to recognize, and one such cost that cannot be measured in monetary terms is the degradation and the loss of biodiversity. Uh, Non-native species play really a significant role and have a really significant impact, negative impact on the local biodiversity. It doesn't matter in which part of the earth we are. And um, what is biodiversity? Edward Os Oswald Wilson, one of the very famous biologists in 20th century, he wrote that biodiversity is the totality of all inherited variation in the life forms of earth, of which we are one, just one species. We study and save it to our great benefit, and we ignore and degrade it to our great peril. Um, um, so this process, when the invasive alien species are coming to an area and spreading, and as I as I showed you, causing the decrease in the na in the in the native uh, in the in the native cover of the native species. It's called biotic homogenization. And I would like to explain you how it how, how it unfolds. And anthropo this is, well, we can imagine this process and an anthropogenic blender that is homogenizing earth ecosystems. Um, it starts with, uh, as, I, as I showed you, with a really diverse vegetation at the very beginning, native vegetation, which is a product of a natural processes like a colonization, and evolution, and then with the interaction of an invasive plant, let's say a pine tree, like in Iceland, and on the example I was showing, then then the native species are replaced. Why? By one, by the invader, because as I, as I showed on during my presentation, the canopy cover of the lodgepole pine, for example, will close more and more tightly, restricting more and more light, which will at the end, eliminate almost all the native species that are present in the area. And um, all these native species that are not capable of withstanding the competition for basic resources, such as sunlight, such as water, nutrients, will be eliminated. And at the end of this process, there is a species poor new plant community that is in no way similar to the original one. And in most cases, it cannot play the same role in the ecosystem. That's what is the what is the most important. When this process occurs in multiple places at the same time, its impact becomes even more severe because it always moves from diversity to uniformity. By, but why should diversity be preferred over uniformity? Someone can ask. Uh, we have to we have to realize that the diversity is the primary source of variation that evolution uh, both produces, but also builds upon. In diverse ecosystems, there are always organisms that are better equi equipped to cope with uh, ch changing conditions. Therefore, when we have a diverse ecosystems, uh, or we have the diverse ecosystem, this ecosystem will be more resilient than any other that is less diverse. 
Diversity can be understood in several ways. It's a species diversity, but it's but it's also, of course, the genetic diversity, functional diversity, um, uh, and in the face of major disturbance, um, diverse ecosystems demonstrate greater resilience and are less prone to collapse. The more limited and uh, the more limited the ecosystem becomes at functional, taxonomic, and genetic levels the more constrained it is in its ability to evolve. And um, natural selection, of course, acts on diversity between the individuals and between species. And without that diversity, the communities are severely limited in the future environment, evolutionary potential. As we could see uh, here during this presentation, uh, the threats uh, posed by non-native species are a global issue. However, however, in Iceland, these impacts are especially noticeable because they occur right before our eyes and within the time scales that are easy to uh, that are easy for us to grasp. And the effect of plant invasions will be further exacerbated by the future climate change, leading to a sharp decline in biodiversity. And we can be quite sure about that, not only in Iceland, but also all across the earth. Thank you very much.